has been a joy to be able to have Dr. Jeff Newman and his wife Sherry here with us from Baptist Men Missions and um, uh, just thankful so much for uh, Dr. Newman's uh, ministry in my life. Uh, I told uh, some of you that uh, he was my first boss on my on-campus uh, uh, opportunity to work there out of the admissions office and uh, prior to that I had a a friend who had uh, had me do a little bit of temporary work at the uh, UPS air, uh, at down at the airport, and I had a decision to make: either I was going to work in the admissions office, or I was going to work at um, the airport UPS. Which both God could have used, but I was so thankful for the opportunity to to sit there in the admissions office and uh, work under Dr. Newman and um, begin uh, helping students consider that opportunity to come to Faith Baptist Bible College. Uh, of course, our friendship has continued on in ministry, and um, I am thankful for God's leading and uh, for the opportunity to hear from the Word this morning, but also uh, for the opportunity for us to hear His heartbeat uh, for ministry uh, as He uh, gets ready to share with us here tonight. You know, when missionaries call and say, hey, we would really like to uh, present here at uh, First Baptist Church, um, and that probably happens two or three times a week um, where a missionary calls and says, uh, we think we'd like to come to your church and present here at your church. Um, when there is a connection to that missionary, when there is a, um, a, a you have a, like a, where you've crisscrossed with them or where they're connected to our church in some way, shape or form, um, that just makes that conversation go uh, so much better. And uh, it gives it direction, gives it a, an opportunity. And, and uh, when Dr. Newman uh, made this transition and we knew that um, that opportunity was going to be afforded to us. Uh, little did we know, I've even discovered here this afternoon at our time with the missionary committee, uh, some more of the connections to our to our church. And so we're thankful for them and uh, wanted you to hear the formality of, uh, of really what this uh, safe haven ministry would look like. And so Lord bless you too, as you come and share here tonight. Lord bless you. Thank you. We've had a wonderful time. We have. Thanks for your good listening to the word this morning. We had a great time with the walkers and appreciate their hospitality, enjoyed wonderful meals. I got a nap this afternoon, so that's a good thing and went on a little bit of walk. And I'm not sure you heard this. I mentioned it, uh, but I was not directed right at you. They're, the home that they have uh, felt like a safe haven to us. So we're, we very much appreciate that. And it's, a, it's a, a welcoming place. So thank you for a wonderful, wonderful weekend. As your pastor said, we are Jeff and Sherry Newman, and we're beginning a new ministry with Baptist Mid Missions entitled Safe Haven for Missionary Soul Care. And so I, I'm the guy who likes to know where I'm going, so I know where I'm going, but you don't, so let me tell you where I'm going, so you know. We want to share testimonies with you and talk a little bit about the ministry that God's called us to is Safe Haven. Baptist Mid Missions produced a video that describes the ministry with some level of detail. And then I want to open the word with you a little bit with our theme verse for the ministry of Safe Haven, Philemon chapter, or Philemon chapter 7, Philemon verse 7, uh, and uh, then um, share the word with you and then talk to you a little bit about the steps that we're on on the path to this ministry. So that's where we're headed. So if I remember where we're headed, that's where we'll go. Uh, I'd like to ask my wife Sherry to come at this time and to share her testimony. Good evening. I had the privilege of being born into a home where both of my parents knew Christ as Savior, and it was their heart's desire that their children would also want to know Christ. 
So it was actually just two months before I turned five years old that I understood that my sin separated me from God. And unless I confessed that sin and trusted Christ to be my savior, I would be separated from the rest of my family for eternity. And that was terrifying. With my mother there in the parsonage of Horton Baptist Church in Northern Iowa, I confessed my sin and I asked Jesus to be my savior. Now you all know over time, I grew to learn that being separated from God for eternity is what would have been truly terrifying. God used the straightforward simplicity of John 3.16 to draw me to himself. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. When I was nine, my father baptized me. And then nine years later, I enrolled in the administrative assistant program at Faith Baptist Bible College where I met Jeff. And we were married after I graduated with my two-year degree. At that time, we anticipated that God was going to direct him into the pastorate and we would serve together as pastor and wife. But as you all know, over the course of his education completion, it became evident that God desired to use his knowledge of the word of God and his gifts to be used in the classroom at FBBC and TS instead of in the pastorate. And it has been our joy to develop lifelong relationships with many of those students, several of whom are represented in this auditorium this evening and others who were here this morning. Um, but the closest ones have been those that we have um, developed when we've served together at our home church of Altoona Regular Baptist. And Ashley's not here this evening, of course, but she is one of those. Um, and there's probably others that I'm forgetting. Um, God gave us two children. We're grateful that both Tim and Johanna trusted Christ as Savior, grew in the Lord, graduated from Faith Baptist Bible College and Seminary, and married spouses who also have trusted Christ as Savior. It's a privilege to watch Tim and Hannah on the left and Chris and Johanna on the right live out their walks with the Lord, desiring that each of their children will also want a relationship with Christ. We now have four there is Lydia. It's our prayer as well that their children will want to know Christ. While our children were growing up and until we began this ministry, um, God allowed me to supplement our income through nannying. And actually, Jeff shared a little known fact connection with this church um, this morning. And my little known fact and connection would be that my most recent job, which was the desire of my heart to someday have newborn twins, was a result of a conversation between those twins, Grammy and Melissa Karras, and Melissa's conversation with her mom. And so all that connection was made and God granted me the desire of my heart. Um, and so with the nanny families, it has been a pleasure to continue to have relationships with them. But now God is bringing to pass the desire he planted in us back 37 years ago to minister full time side by side, hand in hand as a couple. Our desire as we begin the safe haven ministry is that we will continue to draw near to God, representing him well, and in doing so, draw nearer to each other and thereby become instruments of blessing and encouragement to missionaries around the world in their own walks with the Lord as they seek to draw others into a relationship with the Lord. Thank you. I came to Christ in upper elementary school at about the same time as my parents. Uh, my mom and dad came to the Lord after they were married, after they had their first three children. And my dad came to the Lord first. My mom had a few extra hurdles to uh, go over in her uh, the work of God in her life, and she came to the Lord about a year after my dad. My mom and dad were loving parents, but I noticed changes at home, uh, especially after mom became a Christian. And I started asking questions, and there was one night that I kept asking questions, and uncharacteristically so, my memory is that my mom did most of the talking that night. We've kind of reflected on that, and we wonder if it wasn't because 
It's likely she'd only been saved a couple of months when I was asking most of my questions. And my mom and dad, as new believers in the Lord, shared the gospel with me that night and shared John 3.16 with me, the passage that Sherry just quoted for us a few moments ago. And I asked more questions and went to bed. I was a pretty private little guy, and I remember being in bed that night pondering the things that my parents had said to me about what God had done in their lives and what they uh, desired for me, and more importantly, what Christ desired for me. And in my heart that night, I remember understanding my sin, understanding the truth of Christ's death on the cross, and turning and trusting the gospel. Now, we were all new believers, and there's a bunch of stories I could tell you about what it's like to uh, try to figure out things on your own. So thank the Lord that it wasn't too long after visiting a bunch of different churches and going to a lot of different things that were Christian. Anything that was labeled Christian, my dad took us to, and there's some stories there. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, we became connected with Berean Baptist Church in Pella, Iowa, and it was there where I was baptized and uh, was discipled in the Lord and uh, struggled a little bit. You know, I, I was alone. I was a little guy just talking to the Lord in my heart. And, you know, did I, did I do the right thing? Did I say the right thing? Did I? And, and struggled with that for a while. But in the process of being discipled, I came to realize that the first time that I understood the gospel, the first time that I understood my sin separated me from God, and that I turned and trusted the gospel, I became his child. And uh, from the earliest time of being a Christian, my experience in my walk with the Lord was this, this uh, conviction, as it were, that God wanted me to serve him with my whole life. It, it quickly developed. I'm not sure I can describe how it developed, but it quickly developed into uh, a sense from the Lord that I was supposed to be in vocational ministry. Uh, that was confirmed over time by two, in, two separate pastors, two separate times, conversations serving alongside pastors at Brian Baptist Church. And uh, after a, a little bit of a, a rebellious fit uh, in my life, turned back to the Lord and went to Faith Baptist Bible College with the intent, as Sherry said, of serving the Lord as a pastor, a church planting pastor. Junior high and high school, I thought the Lord might have me to be a missionary in a Spanish-speaking country. A number of things changed that over the course of time. So when I enrolled at Faith, I thought the Lord would have me to be a pastor, a church planting pastor. It wasn't until I was in seminary that the idea of teaching was planted in my heart individually, separately. Uh, two of my faculty members at that time, one took me out for coffee, the other took me out for lunch, and said, Jeff, have you ever thought about teaching? And my answer to the first one was no. And my answer to the second one was, funny, you should say that. And uh, the Lord used that to burden my heart for that ministry and gave me the privilege for over 20 years um, especially in the field of biblical counseling, training people who literally serve the Lord around the world. When Sherry switched nannying positions to nanny for those newborn twins, the newborn twins' parents were teachers, and that gave us uh, both a little more flexibility in our summer schedule, and we decided together that we would start accepting invitations that we'd been having for me to go and teach more frequently on the mission field. So that began what became five summers of one summer, packing up for the whole summer and, and being gone, but being in different places, Peru, Brazil, the foreign country of Boston, uh, and, 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 uh, and enjoying ministry together. It was during one of those summers, the summer of 2018, that Dr. Vernon Rosenau, who was then the president of Baptist Admissions, asked me to come and to speak at their family conference. It's a conference that Baptist Admissions has every summer for missionaries who are home and furlough. And he asked me to come to that conference and speak. I spoke. He took us to the airport early the next morning, and we flew to Boston for, I don't remember how long it was, a week or 10 days of ministry, flew back, flew back to Cleveland, and he took us out for lunch. And at that lunch, he began to unfold for us a burden that was on his heart uh, for over 20 years of a place and a couple where missionaries could be ministered to in their spiritual walks with the Lord. A place and a couple who would purposely coordinate uh, the spiritual care of the missionaries of the Baptist Admissions family. And he took 15, 20 minutes, unfolded that vision, unfolded that burden 
that was on his heart. And as he concluded uh, the conversation, he asked two questions. Uh, the first question he asked is, Jeff, you have helped some of our missionaries in the past. Uh, I know your passion for biblical counseling. Would you help us to flesh out this purpose, this plan we have to help the missionaries of the Baptist Admissions family to stay spiritually strong and to serve the Lord for as long as he wants them to serve? And that was a question that was easy to say yes to. So would you help us with this? Would you help flesh this out? And I quickly said yes to that. The second question he asked was, the other thing I'd like you and Sherry to do is to start to pray about whether or not the Lord would have you to be the couple. Well, I had enough miles on my odometer to have learned the hard way that it's not a good idea to sell it, tell someone no when they ask you to pray. So I said yes. Uh, and that began, that began 15 months of conversation with Dr. Rosenau, with Dave Ferguson, who's a part of the mission administration as well, really fleshing out their vision for safe haven for missionary soul care and seeking counsel ourselves and talking to the Lord a lot about what the Lord had uh, in store for us. And that culminated in uh, July of a year ago, us formally joining Baptist Mid Missions to begin this ministry called Safe Haven for Missionary Soul Care. As I said, the mission put together a video that begins, tells a little bit more about us and uh, describes a little bit of the vision for this ministry. So I'd like to play that for you at this time. new department of Baptist Mid Missions, and God has uniquely prepared Dr. Jeff. <laughs> technology is technology, isn't it? One of the hats I wore at Faith was director of educational technology, so I was always the guy everybody looked to when something went wrong. It's not a fun place to be. Yeah, okay, that's, that's probably what, there we go. Hang on. Thank you, Pastor. Okay, Ooh, let me back up two slides. Okay, so now it should start over. Safe Haven Great. for Missionary Soul Care is a Thank vital you. new department of Baptist Men Missions, and God has uniquely prepared Dr. Jeff Newman and his wife Sherry to launch and administer this much needed ministry. Jeff developed a course of study in biblical counseling for Faith Baptist Bible College and Theological Seminary that program for nearly 20 years. He has had the privilege of training pastors, missionaries, and lay people who now faithfully serve God around the world. During his tenure at Faith, he had countless opportunities to provide biblical counseling to people facing a variety of burdens and blessings in their lives. Jeff and Sherry's interest in missions began when they were young and developed into a deep love for missionaries. That love has expressed itself over the years through helping missionaries with their training and in serving alongside them in various short-term capacities, both here in the States and around the globe. Now, God has moved their hearts to Safe Haven for Missionary Soul Care, where they will serve the Lord together as a couple. They desire to continue to draw near to God, to represent Him well, and to become instruments of blessing and encouragement to the missionaries of Baptist Men Missions scattered around the world. Missionaries who will be refreshed and empowered to share the gospel and draw others to a relationship with the Lord. Safe Haven is a department that was created by Baptist Men Missions to afford our missionary family a place that they can go to get help throughout a career of missionary service. A haven is a place of protection. It's a place of quietness. It's a place of peace. And a haven should be safe. We say safe haven, but it should be a place where um, there's a degree of confidentiality where a missionary can go, a missionary family can go, just to make sure they're doing well, to get help they need. You have to understand that missionaries come to us at 25, 27, 30 years of age. We have missionaries that are still serving with us at 70 to 72, 73. That's a long time. And throughout that time, all of us who are children of God, no matter how close we are to the Lord, how hard we work at just keeping our spiritual eyes warm, we need help sometimes. Safe Haven is that place. Baptist Mid Missions is committed to helping its missionaries have lifelong and fruitful ministries. 
safe haven is really essential to that. We, we have a tendency to think of missionaries as being different than the average person. The, the reality of the matter is this, they are ordinary people. They're ordinary people that God has called to extraordinary places. And he's called them to an extraordinary task. And as a result of that, oftentimes they face extraordinary challenges. We know we have an adversary against the work that God is doing through missions. And that adversary, we've learned, he doesn't care what he uses to stop missionaries from moving forward. He doesn't care as long as something stops him. So we all have this target on our back and we can't predict what it will be that will that will discourage or prevent or stop missionaries from moving ahead. Missionaries want a trusted uh, confidant, uh, somebody that they know will understand their situation on the foreign field or in their ministry, uh, yet perhaps it's just not a, a matter that they feel comfortable going to certain other important people in their lives. They want somebody to, to confide in or to seek counsel from, uh, that they would have that opportunity in a safe haven department and safe haven administrator and counselor. We want a place where missionaries can go and talk without a fear that it's going to be broadcast, without a fear that it's going to make the social media, without a fear it's going to make prayer lists and prayer items in churches, and just be able to, to speak with confidence that they're going to receive help, that they're going to find a cure, that they're going to find a way to manage, a find a way to resolve a problem and and move on without all kinds of other people knowing about it. Now, that doesn't take away the authority of the church or the authority of the pastor. What we found is it's actually brought the missionary into the pastor's arena faster than we did before. Because Safe Haven can direct them to that and can help the church understand what they can do for the missionaries. Well, and you, you think about in your own life, reaching out for help. There's always risks involved in that. You're sharing something of your own heart. You've already told yourself what people think about that. And you're trying to decide who's safe. Who can I trust with this information? And you make that decision. And really how a person responds in those moments builds confidence or it tears down confidence. And if it builds confidence, that then confidence or confidentiality that's been entrusted to the person you're sharing with, that person can help you to decide who else needs to be a part of this. So there's, there's a bridge that goes on there from the person that is entrusted with the information back to the person who entrusted them with the information to then together uh, talk to pastors, talk to administrators, talk to people that hopefully together uh, you've decided these are people who need to be a part of helping and serving and honoring the Lord. I think what I'm most encouraged by when I think of Jeff and Sherry Newman and having gotten to know them better in the last year and a half is that they're not about to enter into a new ministry. They're entering into a ministry where they're going to be doing what they've been doing for years, but they're giving it a laser focus on the missionary family of Baptist Mid Missions. I see that they are so sincere and so genuine with each person that they interact with, and they have a, a definite care for the spiritual welfare of the people that they talk to. Our intent is to minister to missionaries uh, throughout their uh, ministry lifetime. And we've had opportunity to interact with missionaries already at various stages uh, in the process, times of just simple questions and times of more challenging things of life. And we desire to reach out to them and we desire to be really known as someone they can reach out to regardless of uh, the challenge, regardless of the time in life. Life is full of impact. It's not just the missionary. Life is full of impact. But missionaries face a multitude of impacts 
because their lives can be a continued series of transitions. During those times, during any time, if you think of change that you have in your life, if there's someone there that you know will listen to you, if there's someone there that you know will take time for you, and when they listen and take time, they will, they will process what you're saying to them before they speak. Uh, they will listen to what you're saying about your experience without debating your experience, uh, but instead really point you to faith and confidence in the word. Uh, that, that helps you through change, whether you adapt to change quickly or whether change is a real challenge for you. Being available for women to just reach out and say, hey, can you pray for me? I always want to be there, available for just a text or a message that says, I'm just really struggling right now, will you pray? And oftentimes they can't give more details, especially at the moment. I, I just want to help them in their walk with the Lord. Jeff and Sherry Newman are uniquely qualified to serve the Lord through Safe Haven. God has already used them in the classroom as well as the counseling room to make a difference in so many different lives. Now the Lord is calling them to become a part of the Baptist Missions team to do the same thing in the lives of our missionaries. As you think about the possibility of, of becoming a part of their support team, let me encourage you with this thought. Someone put it this way, that ministry to ministers is ministry to the multitudes. I'd like to change that a little bit. Ministry to missionaries is ministry to multitudes. And as Jeff and Sherry come alongside of our missionaries here at Baptist Mid Missions, they will help them to have a lifelong and fruitful ministry that will impact thousands of people for Christ. And so as you consider being a part of their support team, realize that you're not just supporting the Newmans. In reality, you are impacting thousands of people with the gospel of Christ that will be reached to the missionaries that the Newmans impact. I'd invite you to open your Bibles with me to the book of Philemon. As you're turning there, uh, I'd also invite you after the service to stop by our display table and to do a couple of things. First, to sign up for our prayer update. And then there's an information sheet there that gives more details about what we'll be engaged in specifically in Safe Haven for Missionary Soul Care. Let me give you one glimpse. In, in evangelical missions, so a little bit broader than our circles, in evangelical missions, those who begin toward missionary service and ultimately return for a second term of missionary service, over 50% who begin do not return for a second term of service. And in the mission agencies that you'd be familiar with, the number's a little better than that, but not a lot better. So one of the initiatives that we're going to be a part of is, and, and we're already starting to do some of this in, uh, in the form that we're in right now, but connecting with the missionaries from their very first interaction, beginning their deputation, staying with them through that path, being a help and encouragement to them alongside of their church, then when they leave for the field on their first term of service, we'll work with their church, we'll work with the field they're going to, to tailor for them a plan. How do Jeff and Sherry need to be a part of caring for you during that first term of service? For some, it will be less involvement because they'll be going to a more mature field with a variety of missionaries. And for others, it'll be more uh, hands-on, more involved in their lives. But for all, it will be us interacting with them and in what we're all familiar with now, Zoom calls and all of those kinds of things, and them always having the opportunity to reach out to us. When they come home for their first furlough, they'll be asked to plan for uh, a few days uh, at the ministry home for Safe Haven to for lack of a better word, to debrief with us, to be able to talk about anything they want to talk about, to give us the opportunity to ask them questions, to help serve them so that they can stay spiritually strong. And there's layer after layer after layer that I could go into in description, but that gives you a little bit of a glimpse of one of the aspects of the ministry of Safe Haven for Missionary Soul Care. We're going to just spend a little bit of time in the beginning of the book of Philemon. 
The book of Philemon was a letter written by the Apostle Paul to Philemon to make a request. We won't get far enough into the book uh, to discuss the request and wrestle with all the things that are a part of that, but suffice it to say for our purposes that it was a request that was completely counter the culture of the time of Paul, but it was a request that was consistently and compassionately Christian. And as Paul is writing this letter, he's really writing it with a with a humble enthusiasm because he's making a request of someone that he knows his reputation. He knew Philemon's reputation. Maybe you've had to make a request of someone before and it's really been a, something you look forward to because you knew the person, you knew their heart, you knew they would be of a mind to grant the request. And then you've probably also had times where you've had to make a request of someone where would dread be the right word for it because you knew them and you knew how they might respond or you were pretty confident how they would respond. Well, Paul wrote to Philemon with a proper enthusiasm because Paul knew Philemon's reputation. And the, the uh, passage in front of us contains the verse that the Lord put on our hearts to be a theme verse for safe haven for missionary soul care. Philemon was a person who was known for refreshing and encouraging his brothers and sisters in Christ. And in our time in the Word, I've got two purposes, which isn't always the best plan for a sermon, but I think you'll understand when I speak the two purposes. The primary purpose is on the screen. God wants us to be people who refresh and encourage our brothers and sisters in Christ. My second purpose purpose is, if you remember nothing else about us uh, with being with you today, I'd ask you to remember to pray for us. And when you would pray for us, even if you don't remember our names, if you'd pray for those missionaries who are going to help missionaries stay strong in the Lord, that they would be Philemon-like people. Because if we're to be successful in what the Lord has called us to, we Sherry and Jeff have to be like Philemon, have to become known as people who desire to and encourage and comfort and refresh the hearts of those that we serve. You follow along. I'm going to read the first seven verses of Philemon and let's spend some time talking about them together. Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved friend and fellow laborer, to the beloved Apphia, Philemon's wife, Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. Archippus was likely the pastor of the church that met in Philemon's home, maybe was even Philemon's son. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God, making mention of you always in my prayers, hearing of your love and faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints, that the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you, brother. In these few verses, we find Paul rehearsing some things about Philemon. Paul talked about the foundations that were present in Philemon's life that made him a person who refreshed and encouraged his brothers and sisters in Christ. Paul begins moving toward asking Philemon to specifically express that refreshing in a tangible way to him and to his new brother in Christ, Onesimus. And then uh, Paul wrote to Philemon, reminding Philemon of the blessings that he's received and that others have received because Philemon was the type of person who encouraged and refreshed his brothers and sisters in Christ. So let's walk through each one of those and encourage and challenge ourselves. When Paul begins this letter, this request, where does he start? He starts with, in verse, in verse 5, I've heard of you. What have I heard? As I thank God, as I mention you in my prayers, I think about what I've heard of you. I've heard of your love and your faith, which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints. So what was present in Paul's life foundational, excuse me, in Philemon's life foundationally that allowed him to become a person who was known as refreshing and encouraging to his brothers and sisters in Christ? Philemon was a person who trusted the Lord and loved the Lord, and he let that trust in the Lord and that love in the Lord develop into a heart of love for his brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, I want you to notice what 
Paul didn't say as he started this letter. Paul didn't start with Philemon by talking about Philemon's talents and abilities. He didn't start this letter by saying, Philemon, I know you, you have this ability, you have this talent. He didn't start by talking to Philemon about Philemon's means, his financial ability, although Philemon was probably a person of means with the home where the church met, and, but he didn't start there. Where did he start? He started with Philemon's heart. And that ought to encourage you and encourages me because God entrusts us with the talents he desires. God entrusts us with the means he desires. But at the foundation of our ability to refresh brothers and sisters in Christ is not means, is not talents and abilities. It's our heart before the Lord. And that means that this opportunity to refresh and encourage one another is available to every one of us that's here tonight because every one of us that's here tonight can have a heart of faith in the Lord, can have a heart that loves the Lord, and can let the Lord develop that into a heart that loves others. And God uses that. God develops that in our lives into the ability to encourage and refresh others. Let me take you for a couple of moments to Boston. This is Boston on the 4th of July. Been there, we've been there over 10 times and been to, been to Boston on the 4th of July twice. And it's a pretty amazing thing for two reasons. One, it's Boston on the 4th of July uh, and all the history and the fireworks are simply amazing. But another is there, Toby and Susan Stevens who are still there and Bill and Deb Edmondson who were there, the church plant, the second one that they're working on, uh, has an outreach every 4th of July where they stake out a little claim on the bank of the Charles River right across from the barge where they launch the fireworks. And the people they're doing Doing Bible studies with, they ask those people that they're doing Bible studies with to invite their friends to come for the day and have food and play table games, which are really blanket games, uh, and to stay and, uh, and uh, watch the fireworks. The two times I've been there, there have been at least 70 or 80 people show up, come and go during the day on that little parcel of land. I've lost track both times on those days at 10 in having conversations with people from 10 different countries that were there that day on that little block of land that they they staked out to be their claim for that day on the 4th of July. Been to Boston and back enough to go again and have Toby or Bill uh, introduce me to someone that I sort of met on that day and say to this person, share your testimony, share about what God's been doing in your life. And they have different details of their background, different details of their history, but somewhere along the path of that testimony, it converges at... I came because my friend invited me to come to 4th of July, or maybe sometimes it was Thanksgiving because they do an outreach then or Chinese New Year. I came to this event and I was watching these people care for me and care for each other. And every one of them has said, my heart was strangely warmed. And they go on to talk about engaging in a Bible study, some in a few weeks, some in a few years, coming to Christ as Savior. We ought to be encouraged with that. I mean, the, the people of this church would fit in the three rows on this side of the auditorium. And because they care for one another and they care for the people that God brings across their path, he uses that refreshment, that encouragement that they are to one another to spill over into unbelievers and to be a part of bringing them to Christ. Thank the Lord that when it comes to becoming a person who refreshes and encourages brothers and sisters in Christ, that we can all be that person that we can have a heart of faith in the Lord, we can have a love for the Lord that grows into a love for others. As Paul moves on into verse 6, he moves toward expressing that faith, expressing that love. How does that happen? And I'm putting on the screen a... Ooh, hang on a minute. Okay. Dr. Newman deleted the wrong slide, maybe. Let me try. This is technology hiccup night. Let me go one more slide forward here. Can you go one more slide forward? My remote cell so stuttering. Okay, well, I'm going to have to tell you what was on the slide because the slide vanished, which means I deleted it when I, you know, it's always user error. But let me talk to you about this. Verse six, what does Paul say in verse six? That the sharing of your faith, that this, this, Mutual conver this mutual trust we have in the Lord that we share together will work itself out, will become effective, will take specific form, 
as you acknowledge the good thing that Christ is doing in you, and you do it for the sake of Christ. So what Paul is saying is this fellowship developed with the Lord and with one another then leads to opportunities, opportunities to express that faith and that love in specific ways. And he's going to call on Philemon to express that in a way. And he caps that off with saying, we do that for the sake of Christ. Now, this, this, this set of pictures is uh, some, of the sa- some of my favorite pictures of my wife on some of our, our ministry trips. And the only reason I put it in front of you is to just give you a minute to stop and think. God has entrusted you with faith. God has entrusted you with relationships with other people. And on that path, he'll give you opportunities to encourage and refresh brothers and sisters in Christ. And we ought to do that for the sake of Christ, for the glory of Christ. Why is it that we don't take the opportunities that are sent our way? Well, I'm going to speak for myself because I'm not going to presume that I know you well enough to speak for you. Jeff's a guy with a plan and he works the day, he works the plan and he works through the day and the plan hopefully works the way it's supposed to work. And there's some days where my plan becomes so important to me that I miss opportunities. Are you like that? You got a plan and you move along with the plan. You look back on the day. Oh man, I should have slowed down there and made that phone call. I should have slowed down there and talked a little longer to that person. So sometimes we miss opportunities because we've got our own plan. Have you ever talked yourself out of an opportunity? Well, you know, I'm not really good at that or somebody else will do it. Maybe you're the person who has taken an opportunity and that's been misunderstood. And it was either ignored because it was misunderstood or there are times where we seek to encourage someone and that misunderstanding of the other person leads them to misunderstand our attempt at encouragement. Actually, eh, this is said a little strongly, but like throw it back in our face. What's Paul say to Philemon? What's he say to us? We take advantage of the opportunities that God gives us to express that faith and love and encouragement to others for the sake of Christ. And it's an encouraging thing to know that anytime you, anytime I speak a word, write a note, make a phone call, do an act of kindness in an attempt to encourage a brother or sister of Christ, that alone is success regardless of the outcome, right? Because when we do that from a heart who trusts the Lord, loves others, and desires to honor the Lord, however it's received is not the main point. The main point is he was honored. The main point is he was glorified. And so we take that faith, we take that love, and we invest it in the opportunities God's given to us to encourage others, and we trust him with the outcome. And what happens? Over time, in his way, he brings blessings as a result of that. Verse 7, Paul says, I have great joy. I have great comfort in your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you, brother. It's very possible that Paul never met Philemon. The gospel probably went to Colossae from from Ephesus. But Philemon was so well known to Paul that just knowing that Philemon was this type of person brought Paul joy and brought, brought Paul comfort. And you think about that. You know, you maybe have a person in your life, I hope so, maybe you don't reach out to them very often, but just knowing they care and just knowing you could reach out to them helps you, right? Just knowing that that person could help you and would help you if you needed it. And we can become that person to one another, a part of the work of God in each other's lives to seek to bless and encourage and to bring comfort and joy to the heart of another person. Now think about who's writing this with me for a moment. It's the Apostle Paul, as it were, one of the first missionaries. Second Corinthians, he's pretty transparent about some of the struggles he had in his life. Paul's writing this letter under house arrest in Rome, constantly under the guard of a Roman soldier, maybe chained to that Roman soldier, having to figure out a way in that context to care for his own needs. Uh, And Paul had been in adversity. Corinthians, he writes about a time when he was in Asia. He says, I was burdened beyond measure. I was burdened above strength. What's he say next? So that we despaired even of life. And you think about that. Paul was a person in service of the Lord that was encouraged by seeing other people encourage one another. In weariness and sleeplessness and toil, 
he talks about in this chapter. And he caps off a rehearsal of the difficulties of his life by saying, on top of all this, besides all of this, the things that come on me every day, my deep concern. You might actually have a translation in front of you that says, my anxiety for all the churches. That's not a bad translation. And what's Paul saying? Paul's saying, in addition to the physical burdens I'm bearing, I'm bearing the burdens of other people. By the way, this reminds you to pray for your pastors. They carry the same burdens you do. They carry the same challenge you do. And they carry an extra lay of burden because they care about you. They love you. They want to see you love the Lord and serve the Lord. And there's an extra concern, dare we even say anxiety, uh, that comes along with that. And Paul was a person who, when he thought of Philemon, and especially when he thought of Philemon in the context of this request, he could say, I have joy, I have comfort in your love because I've seen you, I've heard, I've heard about you refreshing the hearts of brothers and sisters in Christ. Let me show you this photo. This photo was a year ago, August, one of the few conferences that actually happened last summer. It was a conference for the missionaries of Bibles International. Bibles International is the missionary trans, the Bible Translation Society of Baptist Admissions. And the reason why I put this picture in front of you is it really is representative of the whole of the family of Baptist Admissions. There's about 70 people in that picture. So you take that picture times 12 times 13, and you have the whole missionary family of Baptist and missions. And as you look at that picture, you see little children, young children, you see parents, and you see uh, older folks and some who have even retired. And the picture is really representative of the whole. In that picture, I'm not going to point these people out to you individually, but in that picture is a lady standing there who the year before stood there with her husband. And he was at a missions conference and had a health crisis and passed away. And she's learning uh, what it means to serve the Lord, bearing the title of widow and all of the implications of that in her life. You see some parents holding some children. If you have had children or you have children, you know there's great blessings in that. And there's a few challenges in that. And they're doing the blessings and they're doing the burdens uh, serving the Lord. There's a couple in that picture whose children came to Christ, professed Christ, and walked with the Lord. And one of their adult daughters is walking away from the Lord. And they conduct their Bible translation workshops and make their Bible translation trips all the time with that, that, that daughter that they love so dearly on their hearts. There's a couple in the picture whose faces are blurred. Their faces are blurred because parts of the area of the world where they go to in their ministry, it just wouldn't be safe for their image, their name to be attached to that. And so let me circle back to purpose number two. Okay, so purpose number one, every one of us can refresh and encourage brothers and sisters in Christ. Purpose number two, pray for us. We desperately need to be people of faith and love in the Lord, taking opportunities that the Lord gives us to encourage these folks and people like them to do the service that God has called us to. One more picture from this summer. This was the people who were honored. And there's going to be some familiar faces in there to you, I would suspect. Um, these are the people who were honored this summer for years of service. And if you notice the number on there, that group of people represented over 2,700 years of service. In fact, if you total the years of service of missionaries that have served with Baptist Missions, it exceeds 10,000 years of people giving their lives to serving the Lord. And again, it's a, something to put in front of you to ask you, uh, again, to pray for us. We need to be like Philemon to these people to help them to stay spiritually strong and encouraged in their walk with the Lord so they can have their maximum effectiveness in their service for the Lord. So be like Philemon this week. Find someone to encourage. Find someone to seek to encourage and know that just doing that honors the Lord regardless of the outcome. And then pray for us and sign up to pray for us, please. Now, what's the path to this ministry look like? Pray for us. I've already got that there again, our key request from Philemon. We need wisdom right now. We are really enjoying the deputation journey. Do we get tired at times? Oh, yes, we get tired at times. But we're enjoying reconnecting with people we've not seen for years and making new friends. And at the same time, our hearts are really drawn to 
be engaged in this ministry full time. We're doing about 10% or so of what we will be doing when we're, we're fully engaged in the ministry. And we just need wisdom to say yes to the right things and to make the right phone calls and to just walk that path every day that as we trust him, the Lord will make straight. There's two additional prayer requests you can pray for. We're looking to to relocate to a ministry home that I'll say a little bit more on the next slide. And then of course, we're in the process of raising our support for the ministry. The ministry is gonna be going to be funded through three funding means. The first is any expenses that we have that will take us to missionaries. So to get to them on the field and to serve them on the field, anything that we need to outfit uh, the ministry home with the technology to connect with missionaries around the world, that's being funded through uh, a budgeting process in the Global Ministry Center of Baptist Missions in Cleveland. And we've committed to two things. We've committed to raise our personal support. So the things that any missionary would raise to care for themselves. And we're thanking the Lord and would ask you to rejoice with us in the 44% of our support that we received. I'm having another little wrinkle with the the remote. So I'm guessing the, can you do Yeah, there we go. Thank you. And then we're raising uh, funds for a ministry home. When they talked to us about this ministry, they gave us three criteria to locate a ministry home and criteria for what the ministry home should look like. We're asking the Lord to give us a place where a missionary family could come and be with us for an extended time, think a week, 10 days, where they wouldn't feel like they were being an imposition. Uh, and they could feel comfortable, they could feel safe, they could be reminded that God is their refuge and strength. So think of a home with like a mother-in-law's suite or think of a home with a welcoming walkout basement with a couple of bedrooms in it. And so we're raising funds for that home. And as far as location of the home, they gave us three criteria. They said, we want the ministry home to be in a crossroads of travel so that people can get to you easily and would naturally pass through the area. They want it to be in a place of relative size so there could be some appropriate anonymity. So they said, we don't want you to move to Cleveland. They said, we don't want you to stay in Ankeny because we don't want anybody who comes to see you to have to say, answer the question. So, hey, what are you doing in town? And then the third criteria they gave us is they wanted us to find a place where we already had a solid relationship preferably with a pastor and wife, so that we would have people to lean on in the process of doing this ministry. It was, a, it was a blessing to us for them to say that to us. And so we're asking the Lord to provide a ministry home for us in the far western suburbs of the Chicago area. So don't think big city, think uh, Batavia, Warrenville, North Aurora, maybe even Naperville along the DuPage and Fox River Valley. And uh, Thank the Lord that he's already provided for us $150,000 for that ministry home. So rejoice with us in that. If you could advance the slide one more time. Uh, I'd like to pray with you. I appreciate your pastors and their hosting of us today. I appreciate Pastor Dave, Pastor Dave and the time on the phone and just the relationship with both of them over the years. Thanks for letting us have a good day with all of you. Let's pray together. Father, we love you and we're thankful for what you're doing in our lives. We're thankful for pursuing us, bringing us in turning faith to your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And thank you that we can grow in faith in you, grow in love for you, and that that faith and love can then be expressed to one another. Help us to be people who purpose to be an encouragement and a blessing to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Help us to be people who do that for Christ's sake, for your glory. And thank you for the reality that anytime we seek to be a blessing and encouragement, that honors you. And thank you for the people in our lives that have and do continue to bring to us comfort, because, provide for us a source of joy that points us to finding our joy in you. And I would pray that you would help Sherry and me to more and more grow in faith, to more and more grow in love for you, for each other, for the people you've entrusted to our care and help us to be like Philemon to them. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen. And uh, the ministry that God has entrusted to them. And also to think about in individual ministries within our own church and how God is using the aspect of prayer, even in those ministries Todd's going to share with us in regard to the, the young adult ministry. 
Um, we usually meet on, not usually, we always meet on Wednesdays. Um, at the Walker's house, there are probably 10 to 15 of us there. Um, three or four students and other young adults gather together. What's been really encouraging this year was we work through Romans and discuss salvation and security of salvation and fighting sin. Um, just the prayer requests that we share with each other almost always have nothing to do with anything but I'm going to share the gospel with my roommate, with my teammate, with my coworker. Um, so we're, we're pro providing them the tools, helping them understand the gospel clearly, how to, and also praying for one another as we go out into the world and share the gospel with those around us. So as you pray this week, uh, pray also for the young adult ministry, for uh, Todd and Blake and Kim and Dr. Walker and Susan as they serve. And uh, so thankful for that ministry and shaping the lives of, of young adults and to those that play a key role in the life of our church. Let's pray together for them. Uh, Lord, thank you for tonight. Just thank you for the opportunity to hear uh, from Jeff and Sherry. And thank you for uh, the opportunity you've provided to them to be an encouragement to missionaries. We, we think really of, of the privilege we have as a local church to send out missionaries and, and to fulfill the mission that you've entrusted to us all around the world. And our responsibility, even with Nikki, as her sending church to be an encouragement to her and to love her and to serve her and to write notes of encouragement to her. And even as we get to anticipate her being home, uh, even over the next calendar year, uh, the opportunity just to uh, refresh her even during those times. And so we thank, thank you that that's a part of the big picture of Baptist Missions, but uh, fundamentally of local churches and uh, the privilege of fulfilling the mission. So uh, we pray for your provision financially. We recognize that there's always a financial piece that's a part of of ministry uh, because it is required to exist. And so thank you for what you've provided thus far in uh, raising funds, 44% of their regular support, and then the 150000 that you provided for a home. And we ask that you would uh, meet the rest of that need as they anticipate you using them in these ways. And so we trust that you would uh, accomplish that for your glory. We pray also for wisdom as they seek to discern, uh, even through this uh, partner raising time, of how much to invest and when to invest uh, and, and the opportunities that are in front of them. Give them wisdom and discernment. Uh, Lord, I know that it's, the, it's their desire to give as much as they can, and uh, yet also understanding where to, to uh, make choices and even hard choices. Just pray that uh, they would submit to the wisdom that you've given to them in the word and, and the counsel of others as well. And thank you for their sending church. Thank you for Al Altoona Regular Baptist Church and, and for their willingness to send, to send out their best uh, to, to be used in this way. Thank you for that church and their history of uh, walking with you and being used as tools for your glory. And we thank you also for those in our church that are committed to investing in, in uh, young adults. Um, thank you for what's going on on Wednesday nights and, and just the encouragement to hear that these students and those that are leading them, uh, their goal is, is really to see the gospel advance, to see spiritual growth in their own lives and how that's even ev been evidenced even in, in what they're praying about. Uh, Lord, it's, we, we recognize it's not wrong to pray about spiritual things, but supremely uh, beyond all of the physical things of this life, it's walking with you and glorifying you. So thank you uh, for that ministry and thank you for how you'll continue to grow individuals in that and, and even those that even aren't a part of our church family yet using that as an opportunity to connect them to our church. So thank you for all the ways that you're at work for your power and your presence, for you are with us always, even to the end of this age. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand as we bring our service to a close. <clears throat>
be seated. We're going to let the Newmans slip out to the table there so you can catch up with them here after the evening service. Thankful again for them uh, making a part of being a part of us this weekend. And I hope you'll take the opportunity to grab some of the literature that is there, sign up to be one of their prayer par partners, and uh, just continue to be in prayer for us as we give consideration to uh, partnering with them. Just two things that I wanted to draw your attention to. I think probably this morning uh, you had the opportunity to be reminded of them by way of the bulletin. Uh, but number one, I do want you to, as members uh, here at First Baptist Church, to be in sincere prayer uh, for the selection of our deacons coming up here. Um, nomination packets were in your family mailboxes here today. And, um, and there's a list of uh, eligible men uh, that are in our church family. Um, but I want you to be in prayer for uh, who you can nominate and who you will nominate to uh, serve. And in that, Lord, I wanted you to also know that uh, we have two men that have uh, resigned as deacons um, before completing their terms as deacons. And so uh, I just would ask that you would pray for um, uh, Travis Miller and for Pete Karras. Uh, neither of them were uh, indignant in their resignations. You need to know that. Uh, they just came to us and said uh, they didn't feel that uh, they could continue in that ministry at this time. And so that leaves us uh, with the opportunity of selecting uh, six men uh, for the deacon uh, uh, nominations here. So I want you to be in pr specific prayer for that in, in days to come. And then uh, uh, the second one I want to be you to be aware of, uh, we have typically um, in recent past here, when daylight savings time rolls around, we have rolled our evening service back to 5 p.m. Um, and we are, we are not going to roll back to 5 p.m. this coming daylight savings time. So on November 7th, uh, when our clocks fall back, um, we're going to leave the evening service at 6 p.m. Um, somebody asked me, is this a permanent decision, Pastor Dave? Um, I don't know. Um, we're we're going to try it, okay? Um, it just seems like when we come back to that 5 p.m. hour, while it does afford us the opportunity for fellowship after the evening service, which we, we do want to continue to encourage, it just seems like it comes to a very, very short afternoon for melody makers, for deacons meetings, and for other afternoon uh, events that we have, late Riley Missionary Circle and the rest. Everything else moves up that er earlier hour as well. And it does make for a very short afternoon. So we have typically rolled back to 5 p.m., um, but we are not going to do that this coming daylight savings time. And we're going to see how that goes uh, for that for that time frame. And so we wanted you to be aware of those two things and uh, be in prayer for those two things. And we're looking forward to those opportunities that stand before us. God bless you. You are dismissed. We'll look forward to seeing you later on this week. <laughs>